Thank you again for tuning in and we look forward to a great conversation. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our uh, topic of access control and technology. Uh, I'm Shauna Fleischbein with Castle Group. Thank you, Laura, um, for, for getting us started there. Um, if you're not familiar with Castle Group, we are a full service property management company. We specialize in the management of um, associations, both condo and HOA, that have full-time on-site management, and we're located throughout the state of Florida. And I'm joined today by Nathan and Wendy from Invera. So if you guys want to introduce yourselves. Yeah, sure. Thank you for having us. Um, my name is Nathan Barn. I'm the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Invera Systems. And we specialize in this topic. So we only service the unique needs of associations in Florida and now in Texas. We have about a thousand locations and we've organically grown to, uh, you know, over 300 employees doing over 2 million transactions a month through gated communities and also protecting their amenities as well. So we appreciate this opportunity to have this conversation and just really this platform and also the partnership. We're fortunate enough to work with over 200 of Castle Group's uh, portfolio clients and you know appreciate the relationship and appreciate the time today. Thanks, Nathan. And I'm Wendy Wilson, I'm a business development manager here at Invera. I've been with Invera. This is my 11th year now, worn um, many different hats over my time here um, and uh, very excited to be here today um, with our partners at Castle and talk about access control. Fantastic. Well, thank you both for, for joining us today. We appreciate it. And um, we know, you know, you guys are pretty full service there when it comes to access control and security, you know, options. So that's really a topic that, um, you know, Laura and I, especially in our in our territories here on the, the West Coast and central part of the state, um, you know, we've been running into a lot lately. We've had a lot of board members asking, you know, what's out there? What are the options? Are there hybrid options? You know, um, a lot have in-person you know, guards uh, right now or, or people there at their gatehouses. And then um, some have already gone to, you know, virtual or electronic and um, some do both. So we're going to kind of go through that today, all the different options that are that are out there. So I'm going to go ahead and get you guys started here. I'm going to let you take take the, uh, the reins and I'm going to keep an eye on questions. So as Laura said, um, for those joining us today, please feel free to submit your questions and I will kind of feed them over to Nathan and Wendy as we go. Um, if you could just kind of try to keep them on topic, that would be fantastic. And one more thing, because I know everybody always asks this, we will send out a link, Laura and I, to um, this, this recording as well as to the, um, the, the slide presentation. Um, so we will do that and we'll send out Wendy and Nathan's contact information as well. So without further ado, I will hand it over to the two of you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Okay, to get started, let's, um, let's just get a working definition of what access control is. And this is basically a rule-based selective restriction of access to a place based on predetermined guidelines. Um, so within a community, community-wide access control has five primary categories of people that are entering into various locations of that community. So you'll have residents, you'll have staff, you'll have visitors, you'll have vendors, and emergency responders. And each of these different categories require kind of a different solution to get them into the community. And we're going to talk, um, Shauna, about all the different things that you said. So this presentation is really designed to talk about all the common problems and you know that people are facing throughout communities. If you go to the next slide, um, it's wait times at gates, it's capturing information, it's gate strike detection, it's tailgating, it's vandalism, it's people getting into amenities after hours. So really this presentation is going to build by giving you the basics of access control and then talk through all the different options and then talk about, you know, the different options at the gates and then also at the amenities. So really, you know, not selling any solution, but really talking about the common challenges the communities face and then what solutions there are to make those go away. And really quick, I had one person say they're not seeing the slides. Are, is everybody seeing slides right now? I am. 
You are, okay. If anybody else joining us isn't seeing slides, I guess let us know. But um, okay, it looks like most people are. Okay, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Lee, you may just need to change your view options possibly because um, it seems like everybody is, is seeing slides. And it should be okay. the right hand corner for Lee. There's a little view options. And, and really, so, so like Wendy's gonna take this slide, but really in order to, to solve some of those problems, you layer on solutions of access control and camera systems and then start making them work together. And it's really to capture information and store it as data. So capturing faces, license plates, make and model of vehicles, all this type of information that can then be used for boards uh, for many different reasons that we'll talk through and, and solve some of those common problems that they're all facing. So, sorry to back up one slide real quick. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so a community-wide access control solution really should have um, several different components. Um, the first and foremost is the ability to restrict access based on who, where, and when. Um, like Nathan said, there should be the ability to have reportable data on all activity, whether that's through a log of entrances or the video um, that goes along with it. Um, a good system should be easy to use and convenient for residents, staff, vendors, um, and there should also be multiple credential type options, and we'll cover those in detail in a later slide. Yeah, so just to kind of give you the basics before we start building on this, so the foundation of an access control system is going to consist of readers, and those readers that are pictured right there with somebody putting a, a credential up to it are going to be for your doors, they're going to be for your pedestrian gates, they're also going to be for vehicle gates, and there's different types of locking mechanisms, so when you're considering what type of lock is needed, uh, store function lock set is going to be locked on one side and allow for free egress on the other. That would be an electric strike that would, you would want to use there. And then uh, certain doors are going to require mag locks, but with a mag lock, there's code requirements to have request to exit motions and buttons. And if there's a fire system in the amenity, then it'll need to be tied into that as well so that in the event there's a fire or the alarm goes off, it'll drop lock power to allow for free egress. And then in a lot of the new construction, you'll see electrified crash bars just because aesthetically they're very pleasing. So that's when you don't see the mag lock and the request exit motion and button and all the additional devices. It's just one clean bar that's on a glass door leading out to the pool, for example. So those are just some of the basics. Uh, so the, the top picture there is your, your standard reader. And we're going to talk about all the different types and like, or, or excuse me, like Wendy said, all the different uh, credentials. So readers and credential types, and then also the picture at the bottom is showing an RFID reader for, for vehicle entry. So Wendy will take the next slide. Thank you. So like Nathan said, for your doors and pedestrian gates, we typically utilize what's known as a proximity reader. And that means that you've really got to present that credential usually within a couple inches of the actual reader to gain entry. And that works great for pedestrian traffic. But for a vehicle entrance, um, we would use a long range reader that you can see in this image here. Those are awesome because they read up to about 30 feet um, away from where the actual reader is. So it's excellent for the flow of traffic as the vehicles are going through, that reader will read so many times per second to pick up those credentials. So if it's a peak time and you've got 15 cars entering one after the other, that reader can read them all one, right after the other and hold the gate for those vehicles. Um, it's important to kind of drill down that read range for the specific community entrance. Um, if you've got a very long run up, then you can have, you know, a read every second and get people through really quickly. But if it's a shorter run up, you may not want to read from as far away. So just in case somebody's maybe crouching by the gate, they couldn't steal and open because the reader read that car from 30 feet away. So there's a lot of considerations um, to keep in mind when you're setting up the system. Um, it is the most efficient flow of traffic, and we definitely recommend, if possible, to separate out the resident and the visitor lanes in a community entrance. This way, the residents really get expedited through because the reader can read a lot faster than people that are going to have to stop at a kiosk or a guard or something along those lines to be processed individually. So we really usually try to expedite the residents into the community. Um, 
The final uh, big consideration there is the credential types that we would utilize with that long range readers. And there's lots of different options that we'll go through, but the, the most important thing that we try to stress is to use non, non transferable credential types. So these are typically in the forms of stickers that would affix to a windshield or a headlamp or a side view mirror, and they're made to self destruct. So you can't peel them off of one vehicle and attach them to another one. And that really helps you to maintain control over the people that have authorized entry via credential. Yeah, and, and this also, oh, I'm sorry, I was going to say this oh, also please. probably helps with those who, um, you know, as, as part of if you're in arrears, you know, at your association or things like that, and we're making them go through a certain access gate, you know, there's a lot of different um, things that go along with violations and all of that. So this probably also allows for those type of things to, to be controlled a little bit more by the board and or property management or whoever. Uh, I'm assuming as well. It, abs it absolutely does. And you don't want to be a resident and having to be over in the visitor lane as the other residents who know you or your neighbors are like, why is Nathan over there? Oh, it's because he's delinquent on his dues. And you can also shut off access to the amenity, those type of things. You still have to allow them access to their residential unit, their dwelling, as you know. But yeah, you can absolutely do some pretty, pretty fun things with that to make sure that people are paying and paying on time. Yeah, so so with the access control and, and like Wendy said, we're going to talk about the visitor access after we talk about the resident access, but the resident access control is going to be tied into different types of gates. So it can be swing gates, slide gates, barrier gates. And the interesting part is these barrier gates do a couple of things. They protect that ornamental swing gate that are fabricated aluminum. They're expensive. Uh, they open slower, so they're regulated by law to open about one foot per second, whereas that the barrier arm can open really quickly. Um, and then the barrier arms themselves, like you wouldn't think it'd be exciting to talk about something that just goes up and down, but it actually is because now they're, they're technology, they're network appliances. So we can tell uh, remotely from our central station where I am here in Sarasota, whether that gate is open, whether it's closed, they have built-in gate strike detection. So what that means to a community is um, if it's hit, it actually lets us know, hey, I've been hit. And then somebody logs on to those cameras and sees, yes, it has been hit. And then we can pull the tag information and then provide that to the board members, to the property managers to say, hey, that was Nathan uh, that just ran into your gate. And here's everything wrapped up with a bow that you need to go and uh, recoup that gate damage. So that's something that's really interesting that's um, been evolved uh, recently. So it curtails on tailgating and also has the gate strike detection um, they require less power. They're not belt driven. They also um, don't just, you know, bounce. And when they're hit, they're designed on a flange to just break away where they can be easily reset back into position. So you don't have to wait uh, for a technician to come and put the nylon screws back in with counterweights. And it's just avoiding a lot of that cost and maintenance and repair and also just gives you real time information as to the operation of that gate. Um, so, and a lot of these can be standalone barrier gates or they can be tied in to uh, master and slave to the swing gate. Uh, so they can work in conjunction together, but really the access control is just going to tie into different gates at your different entrances to the communities. And one last thing, and I'll stop talking about barrier gates, but. Uh, they open a lot quicker now. So the typical like Chamberlain barrier arm, it says three to five seconds. Um, in these new arms, they can open a 10 foot arm in 0.9 seconds and a 12 foot configuration, 1.2 seconds. So if you think about that, the typical arm, before it's even made it to the apex, this arm would go up and down. So you're really not going to be able to go right behind that other car and tailgate in. So it really does help keep that unwanted traffic from just piggybacking into the community. So there's been a lot of advances in the type of gates that are out there over the last 10 years. And now they're actually extremely exciting and can help communities for some of those real problems that they're all facing. And let's be honest, those gate strikes don't usually happen, just like for property management, the emergencies don't usually happen, you know, during daylight hours when people are there on site to help fix or repair. It happens, you know, at 10 o'clock at night, two o'clock in the morning. So having that instant, you know, um, notification to the people, you know, on your end 
helps in getting that rectified quicker than having to wait for a resident to call property management or call a board member and say the gate's gotten hit, you know, and then have the the train of of events that happen after that. It's more of an immediate, um, you know, situation where where you guys know it happened right when it happens. Yeah, you're hundred percent right. And more more of this industry is moving towards that proactive approach. So traditionally you would buy equipment and you would install it and then it was up to the board or the, the property manager to maintain that access system now with the technology that allows for central station based management and reporting and interaction in real time. It, it really makes it proactive. So we'll talk about some of those solutions and, and how you layer in the, the third party or all in one provider like we are and what we can do with that technology and human intervention. It makes it really powerful for communities. Great. So Nathan talked a little bit about the hardware side of the, um, the resident access control. The software side um, is comprised primarily of the actual controller and that's kind of the brains of the operation. It's, that's where the intelligence is. So um, we design our system so that the, the hardware is really installed on site with, your, um, with, with the equipment being housed there, but then over the internet, we, we back up to the cloud. Um, so you'll always have a main controller at the community site. And then if there's multiple locations, say there's a, um, a main gate and then a resident only gate and an amenity center, those would be nodes that, put, that point back to the main controller. So they're all connected via the internet. Um, they're network appliances. Um, the database itself is typically managed sometimes by community management, sometimes by um, a monitoring operation station or central station. Um, like I said, the equipment is physically housed on, light, on site, but it is backed up to the cloud. And that image that you see there on this slide, it is not a stock photo. That is actually our cloud here in Sarasota, um, where all of the data is backed up from our site. Um, and the access controllers that we utilize and that we recommend are web-based interface. So that allows for remote management. Um, in a lot of sites that we've worked with, there's you know a, a closet where there's a keyboard and a monitor plugged into this controller and then community management literally has to go into the closet to make updates. Everything that we utilize is web-based and it's great for also portfolio community managers because they can manage multiple sites over um, the internet connection. And that's a a real earmark of the way that the technology is moving going and going forward. Yeah, and also like with Castle, with the on-site, on-premise management, this is that co-architecture browser base. So they also have the ability to, you know, lock and unlock doors, add new user, all the different types of things that we can do remotely. They have the ability to do there when they're on site as well, which is really a, a powerful um, all-in-one solution with, with options on how it's managed. And so the, the neat thing is once you have the access control, um, like Wendy said, it, it used to be in a closet. When I started in this industry 20 years ago, it was like an old modem that was like dial up and it, 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 you know, you're waiting on it to do something and then maybe it would upload, maybe it wouldn't take 20 minutes to figure out whether it had failed or not. But now that it's like all internet-based, all browser-based, it's instantaneous. And then it's also open architecture. So where there's a lot of um, APIs that you can start layering different things on top of it. So we just grabbed an example of a community uh, here locally that, that you have a monitoring dashboard so that you can see real live in real time, like where people are going. Uh, you can see if people are trying to access areas that they're not supposed to be. Uh, in this example, we have a little JPEG image of the community's entrance. And then you have live icons of access control, so pedestrian gates and RFID. And so like if you wanted to temporarily open a, open a pedestrian gate, you have the ability to do that right there from that icon. Then you can start layering in cameras so that you can see that, hey, it was Nathan that went through the amenity uh, and not Nathan that took Shauna's badge and went to the amenity because I hadn't paid my dues like we talked about earlier and I've been kicked out of going through the visitor access lane and the amenity. So just the types of things that you can start doing. You can do schedules that we're gonna talk about a little bit later and what those do for the communities. There's even preset threat levels so that if there's AI that has gun detection and then what does that do to the access control in real time, uh, you can pre-configure how you want to be able to respond to that, how you want the access control to lock uh, certain areas down, to have certain areas only be egress. 
have fobs that don't work in areas that did the second before that detection happened. So there's just all kinds of things that are coming uh, that we can continue to layer onto an access control system to really make all these different solutions work together for good to create features that actually have real benefits for these communities. So the programming of the access control software is one of the most critical um, areas to ensure the success of the system. Um, and there's multiple levels within that software that allows us to really tailor the system to the specific needs of the community. Um, reader groups will allow you to combine multiple locations that have similar specs. So for instance, if you have a pool that has three pool gates that lead to that same pool, we would typically group those pool gates into one reader group so that they share common specs. Um, access levels will allow for specific points to have common specs assigned, assigned to it. So for instance, maybe if that amenity, that pool, residents are able to access from dawn to dusk, but maybe staff or vendors may need to have 24 seven access so that they can clean after hours or um, you know, access to the office, that type of thing. Um, door schedules will govern when the time spec takes effect. So you can allow for access with a valid credential read, or you can even, like Nathan talked about, just program the doors open. Um, this could be used at an amenity center to, you know, maybe you just want the front door of the clubhouse to be open while staff is on site from nine to five, or maybe on um, Saturday from nine to 12, there's a community level or a community wide garage sale, and you just want to open the gate so that people can come to the, the garage sale. All of these things can be programmed within that access control panel. Um, the, the next consideration is the management of the database. It's got to be managed to maintain the integrity. Um, old residents, as they leave the community, their credentials should be deactivated. Um, some communities will allow, say, for a FOB for the amenity to be passed from an old resident to a new resident. That would need to be updated by somebody to move that, that specific credential from the old owner over to the new owner. Um, and then also being able to disable credentials, maybe for old vendors or staff, or like you talked about earlier, if somebody hasn't paid their dues and you want to restrict their access to the amenity center, say, until their dues are up to date, um, that's a critical component of the programming of the software. Um, and the final really important thing is the reporting capabilities. Um, you want to make sure that the data that's in that, that controller is easy to access, it's easy to configure and export so that you can really get the type of reporting that's meaningful for you, um, whether that is um, say something happened in the gym and you need to see everybody who's accessed that gym during the last 12 hour period, or maybe it's um, it's something along the lines of um, what's the last used date of a credential so that you can see maybe that the database needs to be cleaned up and you can go through and see, well, here's a handful of credentials that haven't been presented in two years. Probably a good idea to go ahead and disable those um, to keep that database integrity um, on point so that you make sure that you've got a handle on who is accessing those points in the community. Yeah, and this type of information is good to do with any access system. Uh, any access system that's out there, this is just good practice for a board or an access control committee uh, just to go through and say, hey, do we have this configured correctly? Because uh, it doesn't require any additional investment to do this. This is something that you should just uh, go through periodically and say, do we have the right reader groups? Do we have the right access levels? Fewer is better. And then we assign the right people. And then are there tenants that, you know, we're assigning and as their lease expires, so does their credentials. So this is just good practice to do with any existing access control system, whether it be uh, an office building, a school or a community. This is just, just good practice to put in place. Yeah, and, and Nathan, to your point on a property management side, you know, these are things like you said, when it comes to leasing, you know, leases and things of that nature, we have, you know, we talk to communities all the time um, that are that, that's an issue, you know, like, oh, well, we're not really sure how to keep up on the leases and things. Well, access control and in implementing these um, fobs and different things is a great way to be able to kind of help manage that because when you don't have anything, it becomes very, very hard 
to manage. Um, whereas things like this, it, it helps even from a property management, whether you have professional management or it's the board, you self-manage and whatever it is, it has kind of dual pros <laughs> to it oh, um, yeah. other than just the access, you know, point of it or the security part of it. It'll definitely help uh, curtail nefarious activity in the community. We'll have a community say, hey, we've got somebody that's selling things that they shouldn't be late at night. And they have 300 visitors that come and see them between midnight and 3 a.m. every week. That's not normal. So it's this type of reporting and then putting that data in the hands of boards. And for that example, it was over on the East Coast, that board decided to share that information with law enforcement. So they put a sheriff outside of the community when somebody would go to visit that person late at night, they'd get pulled over. That person no longer lives in that community is not selling whatever it was that they were there selling because they couldn't operate that business that they shouldn't have been anyway. So it's, just, it's very powerful, this type of information and what it can do in the hands of the property managers and the boards when put to put to use. Applied knowledge is definitely power. So um, th this just shows the different credential types. And there's been a lot of change in credentials. Um, and, and it's going to continue to evolve. So I kind of want to just tell you where, where it was, where, where it is, and where it's headed. Um, so multiple formats um, of, of uh, credentials. So everybody knows PIN code. So every telephone entry system, and we're going to talk about those, and then the fancier ones that now have the LCD screen, and you can do FaceTime on them. But most of those have some type of PIN code. Um, PIN codes can get passed around, so you got to be careful with that. Uh, if you do have a PIN code, you should have a, a specific PIN code per address, per unit, per person. Like you, should, you could do better with PIN codes than just saying, hey, it's one, two, three, four pound and everybody's got it. Um, and then there's barcodes. So those, those work uh, and they work well. And they're in a lot of communities throughout Florida and throughout the country. Um, so BAI readers are the barcodes that you'll see on the side of a vehicle. And as you ride up that barcode, just like at the supermarkets, reading to say, hey, that's Nathan. It has a weekend output. It can be tied into one of those smarter access control systems that, that Wendy was talking about. And that's a point that I just want to make. You don't have to invest a lot of times in, in completely changing out the access control system. So if you're interviewing companies and um, just know that a lot of the peripheral devices a lot of times can be reused. So readers, locks, a lot of times the credentials, you can do a, a CXB export into an Excel file and then clean that and then upload it into the brains of one of these more modern systems. You can also test to make sure the credential cares about the reader and then the reader, the panel cares about the reader. You can test those existing credentials with any uh, you know, reputable access control provider for them to be able to scan that, for them to be able to decode it, for them to be able to say, hey, this is a 26-bit weekend. This is the FAT code. It's going to work with the brains of the system. So you don't have to go through the headache of re-credentialing an entire community because that's a, that's a task uh, and it has to be done carefully, thoughtfully, and done extremely well. So um, just wanted to just mention that, that a lot of these uh, systems can be upgraded by simply putting a new panel next to the old panel and literally taking one door of access off at a time. So there's no interruption in service to it, a community. You're just basically giving you all the tools to be able to have that fantastic scheduling and reporting that Wendy was just talking about. So after the barcodes, there's RFID, which is what Wendy was saying on the long range readers for the uh, resident vehicles. And that's where the market is still. Um, RFID is radio frequency identification, and it works extremely well because that read range you can't adjust. You can move a lot of traffic through quickly. Um, that's what most people still do. There's, there's credentials that say fob, a card, a sticker, a wristband. It can be many different form factors. But the one thing on the vehicles you got to be cognizant of is what type of vehicle. They put metallic film in the windshields of some of the higher, you know, S-Class Mercedes, Teslas, Maseratis, like those nicer, higher-end, uh, exclusive communities that have the Teslas and everybody uh, needs to watch. We might have to do a credential that's a translucent headlamp sticker, for example, or a sticker that goes on the side view mirror. So there's all different configurations, or you have the guy that just is a classic car enthusiast, and he's like, there's no sticker going on my windshield. There's no sticker going on you know, my side view mirror. So what are we going to do? 
there's a solution for that. There's a bar that goes underneath the hood of the vehicle that you don't see. And just there's just many different types of vehicles. And, and the, there's a right sticker for that vehicle. So you just got to know uh, what you're doing and also plan this to be, uh, you know, an event when you're recredentialing the community because it has to be done thoughtfully. Then that there's NFC, which if you use Apple Pay, it's uh, near field communications. So there's a lot of this access control that's moving to the phone. So that can be the MAC address with Bluetooth. Um, there's a lot being done with biometrics and has been for the last 20 years, it's improving a lot. So like when I'm you know, 15 years ago, there's like a big hand geometry reader where you put your hand in this little guide and it put your fingers in and it get the points to be able to open a door. Um, now the stuff with facial recognition, it's, it's getting very real and it's getting very interesting. Just the same as I said, you can unlock unlock or, or use your phone to pay for something or with Google Wallet or Apple Pay, uh, you can open your phone by just looking at it. So there's going to be a lot done around that and getting into the amenity uh, and getting into the gate point um, and also just touchless environment with what we all walk through with the pandemic. Uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of things that you can have the, the, the phone in your pocket uh, and then that's also Bluetooth has a very long read range, about 30 feet as well. Uh, you could push it out a little farther, but you could just walk up to a door with the phone in your pocket and wave your hand in front of the reader and the door can open. There's all kinds of things that you can do around the phones. And then the stuff with AI we're going to talk about here in just a second is pretty powerful. We're writing new things that have never been done before with AI. But another thing that I wanted to say, the new no credential uh, trend is coming, but just be careful with an older population to just install Bluetooth only readers, for example. There's a lot of readers that can have dual functions. So you could have an RFID credential or a Bluetooth reader. Uh, and that allows for people that are using you know, older technology phones. Um, you're not going to you know, enroll Bluetooth on a jitterbug. You know? So you just got to have the right reader for the right population and have options. Everybody loves options. So it's just better to have, you know, you can have a pin code and an RFID. So there's different configurable uh, readers that will give you options. And just think about the population and the resident population and what's the right choice for that particular community. Uh, and then you can pick the right type of access reader. Also, you do want to make sure that they're not transferable, that they're not duplicated, that it is some type of high security format. Because if you've noticed, like at a bunch of these shopping, you know, Publix, for example, you can go in and there's a kiosk. And just like at Lowe's, we're used to or Home Depot, where you used to be able to copy a physical key. Um, if you're getting an access control system from someone, just make sure that it's not something that you could take that credential, go down to that kiosk and copy it and hand it to your friend. Because that's happened. So if it's not you know, a different uh, bit format with a fact code that is, you know, somewhat higher level security. Just be careful to make sure that you are investing in something that truly is access control for the community and you can't just go copy it. And then the next slide is, is pretty amazing because this is something that uh, we've writ recently written with our AI partner. Um, this didn't exist before. So if you remember, Amazon came out with Amazon Key for Business, where it was a device that used an application. And as they came up to the gate point, it had to be within a certain window, and then they could driver could open the gate. Well, what we've done is started doing vehicle type recognition. And we're going to start talking about all the different automation uh, options that are out there for resident, uh, or excuse me, for visitors. But this one really cuts down on wait time and it cuts down on, on lines. And so what we're doing is we're just loading in templates to our cameras that are existing in these communities. And then we're saying, hey, camera, we want you to know that that's a FedEx truck. And the post orders of the community say that you can let in UPS, FedEx, Amazon, USPS. And so without any wait, I have to talk to the person to then get in. If the camera is automatically recognizing these vehicle types and saying, you've been auto verified, please proceed to the gate, which is just really helping the whole process. Because it, you think about the number of Amazon deliveries that are coming into these communities and it's it's substantial, you know, it's hundreds of thousands of transactions that no are longer having to wait. And what we're doing too is going a step further. Um, you know, first responders will talk about in a minute how they get in. But for me, I said, if we could identify FedEx, we should be able to identify a fire truck. And if we can save somebody's life because they're not having to get out and look for a Knox box, 
and the gates automatically open. That's just powerful things that are coming with AI. So it's really just up to our imagination and being able to have good partners like we do um, to be able to write some of this technology to really help communities. We just had a question come in. Let's see. How are you handling Amazon delivery drivers that are using their own cars? Are you requiring credentials to be shown? So Wendy, Wendy will talk about it. It's it's an option for the, the community through their post orders of how we set up the different people and how they come in. It really is dictated to us by the different boards. So some people say no ID, no entry. Uh, some people say no ID, you can call the resident and let them in. So it's a configurable option based on the desires of the community. And you can lock them down or you can have a little bit more flexibility. It really is up to our communities and, and what they want. Yeah, and because we, I mean, there's, yeah, sorry, yeah. guys. I was going to say there's so many delivery things now, right, between Grubhub and, you know, the pizza delivery person, and, and it, it is right, especially during the holidays, even UPS uh, has people who are using their own vehicles, you know, to, to deliver, and, you know, there's all the grocery delivery, so obviously, you know, there, there's got to be a line drawn somewhere. And for us, yeah, there's probably 30 different types of vehicles that are going to come into the community. And for us, we're doing 2 million of them a month. And I've been doing that for over 15 years. The virtual guarding didn't exist before in Vera. So like we were the ones that pioneered this. And so it's like, you know, a thing or two, because you've seen a thing or two, and they're all very similar problems. And they're all very similar visitors that are coming into these communities. And so, um, you know, at first we used to just open it up and say, hey, no pink cars on Saturday between one and three. But then we really started seeing that there is a pattern of all these different vehicle types. And we tried to make it very easy for our boards and our property managers. So we have a list of all those different vehicle types and then say, hey, here's all the different scenarios. And it's an a la carte that you get to go down through an implementation process and figure out what works best for your board. And just like where Wendy was saying, the read range of that RFID reader is configurable. Some have a long run up and you want to slow cars down. So you, you dial that in over time in a relationship with these communities to make sure that those post orders are right for them. Uh, and they can change. I had a very affluent guy who was a vice president of Stryker, who was a board member over on the East Coast. And he called me, he said, you denied my mom entry into the community. And I said, I said, Larry, I said, that's the post orders and we follow them. He's like, let my mom in and change it to, if they don't have an ID, they can call me. You know, so it's very configurable and it's, and it's specific to the community. Perfect. So there are several different types of access controlled vi visitor verification, um, and we'll go through a few of those now. Um, On-site man guards are typically the most prestigious uh, option available, but this requires a physical guardhouse on site. Um, not every communi community entrance is going to have their real estate to have an ADA compliant guardhouse. Uh, they're very expensive to build. Um, so this obviously is not an option for every single community. Um, those on-site guards are also the highest cost option. I believe um, currently for 24-7, one-man guardhouse is about $195,000 a year is the average, could be more in some areas, just depends. Um, that on-site man guard is not necessarily going to be the most efficient, and it doesn't necessarily collect the most information on the visitors because it depends on what, if any, software is being utilized by those on-site guards. Um, in the line of our work, we've gone through many, many guard houses with, with live guards there. Sometimes they're writing it down on a clipboard. Sometimes they're waving you through. Um, there's a lot of inconsistency uh, a lot of times with the on-site guards. Um, staffing is also a big challenge. And I think we started to really see that come out of COVID where, you know, guards were calling in, uh, just calling out and not showing up. And particularly the overnight shifts were impacted. Um, so this brings a great opportunity to utilize what we call a hybrid system. So that allows maybe for your daytime or peak, peak hours to have that live guard on site to maintain the prestige of the entrance, but you get the best of both worlds. You get the cost savings um, for the overnight shifts. You don't have to worry about call outs because we've got a monitoring center that's fully staffed 24-7 to the volume of transactions. Um, we monitor those metrics to make sure that we are staffed in fact, over the, the amount of transactions that we're anticipating during those times. Um, 
And you also get to maintain a single visitor management platform with this system. So with us, you would utilize MyInvera, whether it's one of our guards in our monitoring center or the live guard on site. Your resident only has one system to keep up with um, in terms of making sure that their guests are registered. Um, the, another option for access controlled visitor verification is a tele-entry. I think everybody has seen those. They're pretty common and it's typically the least expensive system. Um, there's little to no archive data on the entries that are coming in and out um, with that because it's very common that those four digit codes get passed around. So a resident, instead of saying, when you get to the call box, scroll through the very long list to find my last name and then call me from the box instead, here's my pin code, it's five, six, seven, eight pound and just keep it. I've seen actual post-it notes on tele-entries that I've gone through that have a code on the post-it note before. So they're very, very difficult to maintain this integrity of long-term. Um, they're typically pretty archaic to manage. A lot of times it's like a dial-up connection to update new users and take out old users. Um, so they get to be a little bit of a bear after many years at a, um, pardon me, at a community entrance. And then the next type that we'll talk about would be an intercom system, which works really similarly to a telephone entry. It's just a little bit more upgraded technology. Like Nathan mentioned earlier, you can kind of FaceTime with your visitor to the gate, but it requires a smartphone for the resident to be able to take that call and see their visitor at the gate. Um, so again, not a great option for some of those communities that maybe may have a, a, a more elderly population that aren't going to have smartphones to be able to answer those those calls at the gate. Also high traffic communities. So, I mean, these are good up until 150 ohms or less, 100 even better. Um, if you're trying to move a lot of people through a community of 500 homes, 1,000 homes, this is not going to be the best option for them. Um, just because of the amount of time that it take on each one of those transactions. Um, so just th those type of considerations really matter in the configuration of what's going to be best for the community. And I believe, you know, I've just spoken to some communities and boards, we even have some who've made the transition. And, you know, there's ways of, too, of kind of monitoring if you're trying to figure out, you know, okay, we're going to do a hybrid model, but we need to figure out, you know, when is the high traffic time? When does that end? When does it make sense to not have, you know, a physical person there anymore? Um, that's when you can go in and you can kind of log that for a little while to find out, you know, when the more high traffic time, like, ends. Um, and when it makes sense to go to a virtual, you know, option. Absolutely. And, and it's also, there's a huge return on investment for any hybrid. And hybrid is a really nice one. A lot of the 55 plus communities that are being built, uh, we're working with, and this is what they do. So they have a guard there during the day using our technology. So you go away from that clipboard and you have the accountability to follow post orders uh, it, and then also, it's just nice. They hand you a bottle of water. They tell you about the model of homes. They give you directions. And then after hours, like you were saying, Shauna, where there's really not as much traffic, uh, but then you utilize that virtual guard. Um, it, it really is a nice sweet spot to have both and still save money and really have the system pay for itself pretty quickly. And then start saving significant amounts of money depending on uh, how many hours we would take and the size of the community. So there's different types of, of visitor verification. And again, these, these didn't exist 15 years ago. We started implementing different ways to move people through communities quickly and efficiently while capturing and storing a bunch of information and using that data to help solve all those common problems that I started off talking about when we started talking. Um, but really, I, I want Wendy to talk uh, first about one of these or technologies, but we're going to talk about each of them. License plate uh, recognition, driver's license capture, and QR automation. And there's different considerations, again, for which one of these you'd like to utilize for the particular community. So um, the best part about these is they just, they capture so much information and repeat visitors start getting in extremely quickly. I think we're ready for the next slide. Oh, sorry. I thought this was the one. You were fine. No, no. It's okay. Okay. So we'll start by just talking a little bit about Invera's virtual guards. Um, we have remote agents, our, our monitoring operations center, which you actually see in the bottom left photo there. That is not a stock photo. That is actually our, our call center. 
Um, so we process visitors from across Florida and now into Texas. Um, like Nathan said, we're taking about 2 million transactions per month. Um, the technology of our system utilizes ground loops and push buttons to trigger the transaction to come into our proprietary software. And then the agents that we have will process the guests in the order that those transactions come into the, the call center. The metrics are kept and tracked showing agent proficiency, expediency, total transaction volume, timestamps for the length of time it takes an agent to answer the call and also how long it takes to fully process that visitor. Um, all of those metrics are, are tracked and kept, like Shawnee, you were mentioning earlier, to be able to even see, like, when is the peak volume? Every community is going to be unique in terms of when the, the peak volume goes through those gates. And that's useful for a lot of different reasons. Um, a, so that we can get our arms around, like, when are you going to have the most wait times, right, for your visitors and stacking issues, but also... Some communities may opt to maybe lock open their swing gates during those peak times because they take a little bit longer to operate than the barrier arms. We can get a lot more cars through just utilizing the barrier arms. So those metrics are great for a lot of different things. Um, Nathan also kind of touched earlier on like being able to look at individual residents um, visitor history. Um, in the time that I've been with Invera, I've met with a lot of different communities, and I typically would pull that report to, to bring to meet with boards and CAMs, and every single time there are at least a handful of residents that have well outside of the normal volume of visitor um, visitor volume. And it's always interesting because the CAMs and the boards already typically have their eyes on those residents anyway for maybe other reasons, but then this just kind of gives them a little bit more information um, in terms of maybe, you know, violations uh, for HOA covenants and that type of thing. Um, so we take those metrics very, very seriously. We track them. We have a manager that's devoted to nothing but like, the predictive metrics and in terms of volume to make sure that our 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 call center is staffed to that volume. Um, we do have a full-time trainer on board. Um, so he does all of the training for the new, new employees, but also supporting those hybrid guards. So we work with other guarding companies that may have a guard on site and we provide them ongoing training with our software as well. Um, we also utilize that artificial intelligence again to review those agent transactions for quality control so that we can continually train and coach our, our guards and ensure that they're delivering the, the highest level of service for all of the visitors coming through. Um, and by utilizing a pool of agents, those costs are shared over many sites. So it's a lot less expensive than having a single on-site guard. And we also have a lot more oversight to what that guard is doing. Um, everything is recorded, both audio and video, so that we can always not only go back to those guards and coach them, but then if anybody ever says, you know, I waited in line at the kiosk, you know, this time, or I had this situation, we can always go back and review it and report back to the, the board, the CAM, the, re the individual resident, and um, on what specifically happened in that individual transaction. Um, one other reason that we keep a big eye on those metrics is our contracts always um, include a service level agreement that will answer 85% of the calls in 30 seconds or less. Um, currently, our company average, I think we're between 93 and 95 percent. I think we looked, Nathan and I looked just before this presentation, and today the average time to answer was 6.8 seconds. Um, so we're always keeping our eyes on those things and making sure that um, while the efficiency in processing people accurately is the most important thing, timeliness is, all, all, is our second priority in making sure that we answer and respond and get people processed through the gates as quickly as possible. And the next slide, one of the things that allows us to do that is, is automation. So all the systems that were out there before in Vera, you'd have to either put in a PIN code uh, or the guard would have to manually get your license, write it down, drop, go walk back to the back of your vehicle, take that down, you know, come back, cross-reference that on something, call the resident. It all takes time. So how do you do it more efficiently? How do you capture that information and how do you store it as data? So uh, driving down the road, I was like, how are they doing that? SunPass is no longer a sticker. I can register my tag with a credit card and just drive through the fast lane. So we said, well, we can do that if the state of Florida can. So we found cameras that take 200 frames a second. Um, they do nine different IR bursts. They're learning optical character recognition. So if you had a tag that was sample, Sierra, Alpha, Mike, Papa, Lima, Echo, it's learning that. So the first time I come to visit 
I'd say, hey, Shauna, it's, you know, we, or you got Nathan at the gate, do you want to let him in? And while we're doing that, it's registering that tag as Nathan. So then if I'm on your guest list as a date range, one time permanent, like when I come up the next time, it's going to cross-reference that data based on my tag and within two seconds cross-reference our cloud and say, you've been auto-verified, please proceed to the gate. And what happens is as you implement one of these uh, solutions for a community, it takes just a little bit of time for that system to learn and start automating 10%, 20%, 30%, 50% of that guest traffic. And what that does, it just makes for a much more you know, efficient process to have visitors gaining entry into the community and then still storing all that information of make and model, face of the person visiting, license plate information, all that information and storing it as data. So the next type of system that we utilize for automation is the driver's license scanning technology. So this system utilizes the same type of optical character recognition that Nathan just described for the license plate recognition system. Um, it's just taking the information off of the front of the driver's license. The system can recognize all government issued IDs as long as they have the same form factor. So, you know, typically a credit card size piece of plastic. Um, very important to note, we do not extract any data from the magnetic strip or the barcode on the license itself. That is forbidden by Florida statute. So if um, any community is looking to do anything with driver's license technology, it's very important to make sure that the provider is in compliance with the Florida statutes. Um, we're simply using that optical character recognition to essentially take a picture of the front of the license, convert the um, the name into a sequence of zeros and ones, so it's fully encrypted. We don't have public facing servers, and that data is only attached to that visitor record associated with the resident profile. Um, it does take slightly longer to scan an ID than it does for that license plate recognition system. So like Nathan kind of touched on, different solutions really are specific to different communities. If you have a very short run up, maybe two cars only are able to stack at the uh, kiosk before you're into the right away, you definitely probably should look more at a license plate recognition system because it's going to expedite people through faster. Um, you'd probably be adding 10 to 30 seconds to add that license, the, the driver's license scan. So it does take a little bit longer. Um, this system is also really great though, because it integrates really well with that hybrid system we talked about. The on-site guard can be um, provided with a desktop scanner. So it feeds the same data into the same system and it's easy and simple for, for the on-site guards to utilize as well. And an, another form of automation that's been adapted throughout the travel industry, most times you board an airline, you used to print your paper ticket uh, or go get it as you checked in curbside. Um, now you just have an app. So uh, you have an app that allows for you to download a QR code and then present that to everybody and get on the airplane. We have the same thing through our application that Wendy's about to tell you about our application that's designed, built for communities. Um, but we have the ability to have QR codes so your resident can send a pass, one-time date range permit to somebody that's in the form of a QR code. And what's nice about this one where the other ones have to learn, this one can be used as a, a first-time visitor. So if I want to send you a pass, I can send it to you straight from my application and then you can ride right up to the kiosk, not have to wait, present your smartphone and come right in. Um, we've done some stuff with Bluetooth as well. So there's just more automation things that are happening. There's also things that are happening now with your digital ID, uh, which we have an answer for that that's about to come out. So where you have all in one uh, ability to either have a, a driver's license, QR code or digital ID from the kiosk. Uh, so there's just a lot of automation platforms that we continue to design and implement for our communities to really just make it a better visitor uh, experience when you're coming to visit your friends and family at, at, at these different communities. So visitor management software um, is really one of the most critical components of the system as well. Uh, you want it to be simple and easy to use for both your residents and staff of the community. Um, we're very proud of Mayanvera. It was developed 100% by us. Um, the updates and enhancements that we make to the, the app 
and the web portal, a lot of that is feedback that's come from our customers. Um, and we have our own software developers in-house, um, and they take that feedback, and we look at you know, what are the, the most requested things, and we just did a big enhancement um, in the past couple of years, which you can see in, in these images here. The, the portal is, is accessible either via the web or there's an app for Android or Apple devices that you can download, and that is probably the most popular form of um, guest list management that our, our resident customers utilize. Um, it's real time. Everything goes to that cloud uh, that, that we talked about and showed you earlier. So the data will sync real time with our servers. So both our agents and on-site guards will see those updates immediately. If I add somebody to my guest list right now at 1256, as soon as I hit save, if that person rolls through the gate 30 seconds later, it will be on the guest list for either an on-site guard or a guard in our central station to be able to see. Um, we offer a lot of customization for the visitor types. So if you know you want to add your sister to your guest list, you can add them as a permanent visitor and they can access the community anytime 24-7. But we allow you to add time and date parameters to restrict your visitors. So perhaps you've got, um, you know, Grubhub is coming and it's just a one time. You can add them as one time. They come through as soon as they're processed, they fall off your list. If you're having, I don't know, maybe you're uh, new flooring installed and the vendor is going to be working at your house for the week, then you can add them as, you know, Monday through Friday, they're allowed to come. You can actually say, I don't want them before 8 a.m. or after 5 p.m., only during business hours. You can say, if anybody arrives outside of that window, just deny them, or you can say, call me at, for verification. There's a lot of different customization there. Um, like Nathan mentioned, if you have a QR enabled site, there's the ability if you add the phone number or the email address for your visitor the, directly from the app or web portal, you can send them that QR pass for entry. Um, the visitor history will display within the app and the web portal, but you can also sign up for email, text, or push notifications. Every time you have a visitor come through the gate, you can get a notice, Nathan Barn just uh, entered the gate to visit you, and then I know that Nathan will be showing up at my house within a few minutes. Um, and then also all of the contact information that we use for the resident is available under the account tab. And that way um, the residents are able to update phone numbers, update um, you know, email addresses, change their PIN code. Um, you can add household members as well. So say your mother lives with you, you can add her as a household member with full um, ability to make updates. But maybe you have a 12-year-old child that may get a visitor, but you don't necessarily want them to be able to make updates to the guest list. You can restrict those things as well. So there's a lot of customization available within that visitor management software. And, and like I said, it is it is a very important component to making sure that the that the needs of the community and the residents are met with the processing of the visitors that come through the gates. Yeah, and I think it's pretty cool what Wendy just said as far as those different features that benefit the communities. We're a small company that organically grown grew until the, to the largest access and video management platform in the United States. But those ideas came from our partners, from our relationships with our communities, from our partners like Castle Group who come and say, hey, it would be nice if we had this. Well, because it is in-house, we can write those things and we continue to write those things. And as they become available, we just push them out to, their, to our communities so they get the benefit of, you know, these common problems that everybody's facing. And as we solve them, we just make them available to everybody. Um, this, this I mentioned earlier, but it is important. So we talked about visitors, we talked about residents, we talked about guests, but just in any, any solution that you're going to invest in as a community, um, you know, you have fiduciary responsibility. You also have the responsibility of, of making sure that the provider is permitting properly and getting the proper uh, emergency response type uh, recognition into the solution. So there's 67 counties in Florida. There's different municipalities. There's different code. The authority you have in jurisdiction is going to tell you what you need to have for the first responders of that area. So it's clicked in or it's siren operated system where a certain Yelp can be played to get in. It's a Knox box for the fire department. It might be a combination of those. It might be certain clickers with dip switch settings, but just make sure that whatever solution that you're, you're looking into, uh, that you have the right devices in place for first responders because seconds matter and, and making sure that you're in compliance with your local uh, you know, code enforcement will make sure that, you know, nobody ever has a hard time getting into the community to help save one of your neighbor's lives. 
and, and we're we are at one o'clock on the dot. I know you guys did great there. So we did have a couple. I wanted to, since we're getting close, I wanted you guys to be able to get through. We had a couple of questions um, come in. So one, um, I know one of the slides a little bit back um, mentioned it, but could you elaborate a little bit more um, on stacking, how you handle stacking? Yeah, so it's it's different for every community and, and we have different protocols in our post order that say, hey, if this community, because basically every community is going to have a perpendicular road, that perpendicular road might be 30 feet, it might allow for five cars, but it might, it might allow for 50 cars. Depending on the community, we can do a lot of different things where our agents are going to ask different questions. So with speed, you're giving up some security. So those different choices that the community board members are making based on a stacking event, we're going to react to that differently by the community. But we have cameras that are faced to that perpendicular road for stacking events. We put loops in the ground that say, hey, I'm stacking. We can do automatic stacking protocols for some communities where they just want to clear the gate for 30 seconds and then you go right back to standard operating procedures. Some communities might want to say, hey, we still want to ask who they are, but then we're not going to have to call the resident to gain entry until we clear that stacking event and then go right back to how we were doing it before. So there's a bunch of different options depending on the, uh, you know, the layout, the site requirements and what's possible, but there's so many different options for us to be able to say, hey, this is going to work best for your situation. Uh, and we're going to react differently on stacking events based on the post order, and it's going to let us know, hey, I'm in a stacking event, so it's not going to get pushed to the next available guard, to the next available guard. That guard is going to be dedicated to clearing that stacking event, and it's going to be done how you tell us you want it done. Perfect. Um, and then one more that came in, uh, remote system susceptibility to power outages. <laughs> That's a good one. So, We're in Florida, you know. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, uh, the next FLCAJ, there'll be an article on uh, DITEC, which is a partner of ours that serves suppression. Uh, so you definitely want to check that out, but also just make sure that you are surging everything. You would surge your head end. You would surge every peripheral device. You'd surge your you know, 75 inch TV at your home, you might want to do that uh, for the surge protection for your access control system for your community. Uh, you also want to look at battery backup. You want to look at, you know, milliamps and what draws on the different cameras and how long it would be out. But really, that's more intermittent. And even though it's a lightning capital of the world, world most surge comes from within the community, not outside of the community. Um, but, but if you truly want to back up, you'd have to have a generator. You know, most cases it's just intermittent power blips and that's gonna get you through. In the event of a hurricane, you're gonna open and secure those gates anyway. Uh, if you lose power and you lose internet, you do need to open the gates to allow for free ingress and egress uh, by code, by law. Um, but you can do a lot of things to make sure that those gates stay closed as much as possible. We also put in devices where we can monitor uh, hard drive failure, camera failure, internet failure in five minute increments. If it misses three of those five minute increments, so for 15 minutes, it goes into a remote resolution queue here where we can solve about, I think it's 30, 40% of those incoming issues where you would typically have to roll a truck. But because we're pinging those devices saying, hey, are you there? Are you working? Just like at your house when you lose internet, the first thing we'll tell you when you call customer service is unplug your router, wait 30 seconds, plug it back in, and it magically fixes itself. Well, we can do those type of things remotely from our central station, uh, avoiding the need for truck roll, avoiding the need for service charges. So power and internet are a big deal. Also, internet, uh, you can have redundancy. So you can have automatic failovers as well. Uh, whereas power, it's probably going to be at PL or one of these local providers. And if you're without power, gates need to open. But on the internet, you might have multiple ISP providers and you could automatically fail over. So if, if a you know Verizon went down, a Bright House takes on or Comcast or you know fill in the blank of the name of the provider that's available to you. So there's a bunch of different uh, you know thought that goes into trying to ensure maximum uptime from the way that it's designed the components that go into that solution, and then the way that it's monitored in real time, and then also how you can respond to it, you know, in the event that you have a situation. Perfect. Well, Nathan, Wendy, thank you so much for, for this great presentation today. Um, you know, I think everybody probably found it 
informative and helpful and uh, open their eyes to, to some things. Um, and so we appreciate your time and um, this was great. So I thank you. And um, like we mentioned in the beginning for anybody who may have joined later, we will, uh, Laura and I, by the end of the week, we'll send out emails to anybody who registered that has a copy of the presentation, has a link to the recording, and also has um, Wendy and Nathan's contact information. So be on the lookout for that. Um, and thank you. I hope you know everybody has a great day. Nathan, Wendy, any closing yeah, remarks? I'd just like to say thank you for the partnership. Uh, many years and built over trust and a relationship and just learning from, you know, the people that we're fortunate enough to serve. So thank you for this partnership. Thank you for this platform. Thank you to our clients that might have joined this presentation today and those that would, you know, like to join our family. We'd love the opportunity to discuss any of this that was covered in this presentation or anything else that you'd like to talk that regards security for your community. So thank you, Shauna, for the time today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. I hope everybody has a great rest of your day and rest of your week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right.